Good evening, everyone. I'm Richard Wendorf, the Stanford Calderwood Director and Librarian of the Boston Athenaeum, and it gives me great pleasure to invite you to an evening devoted to the question of comic fiction. Uh, we have a panel discussion this evening. Uh, I'm going to introduce our three novelists. Uh, they're going to uh, hold a discussion among themselves, and then they will throw the room open to questions and answers. And then afterwards, uh, during the reception, uh, all three of them will be signing copies of their books. Uh, so let me uh, ask our three uh, novelists to come sit here, and I will, I will, all three of you at once, and I will introduce you. Mm. Mammy of Medwed is the author of three novels, Male, Host Family, and The End of an Error. Her short fiction has also appeared, of course, in many publications. The New York Times pronounced male, quote, wacky, funny, an off-the-wall tale full of hilarious twists and practical wisdom. A longtime Athenaeum member, she lives in Cambridge where she teaches fiction writing. Male has been optioned by Archer Street Films, and will be directed by Sharon McGuire, who directed Bridget Jones's Diary, with a screenplay by Wendy Wasserstein. Tom Parata's new novel, Little Children, will be published uh, next month by St. Martin's Press. Parata is the author of four previous works of fiction, Joe College, Election, which was made into a successful film starring Matthew Broderick and Reese Witherspoon, The Wishbones, and Bad Haircut, he has taught writing at Yale and Harvard and has worked as a screenwriter as well as as a journalist. He grew up in New Jersey, and he now, very wisely, lives outside of Boston. <laughs> Stephen McCauley is the author of four novels, The Object of My Affection, The Easy Way Out, The Man of the House, and most recently, True Enough. A graduate of the University of Vermont and Columbia, he's taught writing and literature at the University of Massachusetts, Boston University, Wellesley, Harvard, and Brandeis. In 1998, he was inducted into the Order of Arts and Letters by the French Ministry of Culture. You might want to ask him about that. I did. <laughs> <laughs> so our first uh, speaker this evening is Stephen McCauley. Hi. <laughs> Welcome and thank you for uh, braving the crowds uh, to come here tonight. We did s plan on staging a uh, costume malfunction, but um, <laughs> the leather bustier did not make it back from the cleaners. And it's the only one I own, so we're not going to do that. Um, a few nights ago, Maymeeve and Tom and I got together over pizza to discuss the program for this afternoon. and. Um, the first thing we did was to check the Athenaeum brochure to see what we were supposed to talk about. Um, and when we saw that it was the, the comic novel, we were initially um, quite relieved uh, because we all, at least in our minds, write comic novels and we were therefore reassured that we wouldn't have to do a whole lot of uh, research to prepare this talk. Um, but the more we discussed it, the more uncertain we became. Uh, given the fact that everyone loves to laugh and that no one will admit to having a, an impaired sense of humor, you would think that the comic novel would be a revered and rewarded literary genre. And yet, if you look through the um, canon of American classics, you find a list of some of the most brilliantly, articulately, and impressively unfunny writers to put pen to paper. There's, for example, Theodore... An American Tragedy, Dreiser, uh, John, The Grapes of Wrath, Steinbeck, Willa, Death Comes to the Archbishop, Cather, Ernest, For Whom the Bell Tolls, Hemingway, uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Herman Melville, and James Fenimore Cooper. Um, insightful, intelligent, and supremely talented, of course, but uh, funny. There's probably a copy of the Deerslayer in the stacks here. You should 
uh, check that out to, to decide. Somehow or other, Mark Twain made it into the canon, but at least once a decade, a writer such as Jane, the age of grief, Smiley, comes along and tries to push him out and replace him with um, Harriet Beecher Stowe or someone equally dour. The British, with their love of wit and their depressing climate, um, <laughs> appear to have a higher tolerance for the comic. There's Daniel Defoe and Charles Dickens, Evelyn Waugh, Kingsley Amos, P.G. Woodhouse, and the ever-admired Jane Austen. But on both sides of the Atlantic, it's rare that literary prizes are awarded to comic novels. Richard Russo has said that an unspoken rule for the Pulitzer Prize is make the judges laugh, and you've pretty much ruined your chances. <laughs> um, the Pulitzer was awarded to what is arguably the funniest novel ever written, A Confederacy of Dunces, um, but I suspect the judges felt that the author's tragic suicide mitigated some of the hilarity of the, the book itself. Um, in a recent review in the New York Times book review, novelist Lewis Baird wrote the following, Few foundlings enter the world less auspiciously than the comic novel, distrusted by publishers, disowned by publicists, cold-shouldered by literary panels and MLA conferences, the grimy urchin takes its place in the back of the shelf and pleads for love. Who has the heart to tell it that laughter is the least predictable or explainable thing in the world, that the most a comic novel can hope for is the slow, easy smile of recognition and then oblivion? In fact, the overall state of the comic novel in the world of literature is downright depressing, which is perhaps appropriate because comic novelists, along with comedians, are notoriously depressed, neurotic, dysfunctional, and unpleasant people, um, frequently misanthropic, abusive, and or alcoholic. Present company excluded, of course. Um, but think of Woody Allen, John Belushi, Lenny Bruce, Philip Roth, Evelyn Waugh. Dickens himself was a notoriously distracted and distant father and um, husband. And it's probably only a matter of time before Jane Austen is exposed as a pill-popping, tormented sexual predator. Uh, <laughs> I'll buy that biography for sure. Um, the truth is we decided that it might be best not to discuss the comic novel at all this afternoon because the whole topic is just too grim. <laughs> so instead we decided that since I'm the most controlling of the three of us and have the least to say, I would ask questions of the other two <laughs> about their work, their writing process, their sources of inspiration. Um, and then we'll open the floor to your questions. So if in the course of the next 45 minutes you're trying to decide between uh, listening to us or thinking up a question for us, we would prefer you would do the latter. Yeah. <laughs> um, and in order to add a little levity and lightheartedness to this afternoon's proceedings, it would probably be best to pretend that Mamie and Tom write novels that are deadly earnest, morose, glum, and tragic. And if comedy comes up in the course of the conversation, I should do my best to change the subject. I hope that's all right. But I'm not serious about that anyways. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. Um, I thought we might begin with the question of uh, the, the most important, in my mind, and the least elusive of a writer's quality, and, quality, and that is um, his or her voice. And um, a writer's voice is one of those, you know, I know it when I see it, qualities like pornography and inherited wealth. And... Um, <laughs> Uh, but it's partly made up of a writer's individual relationship with language and uh, partly something about the way the writer sees the world, I think, because long before you say something, you have to see something in a particular way. And um, Mamie, if, if we could begin with you. Um, you've written three somber novels, um, Male, Host Family, and The End of an Error. How did you manage over the course of the past several years with such a string of successes to sustain your consistently pessimistic and tragic view of the world? Um, or to put it a little differently, yeah. can you point to any aspects of your life, upbringing, education that have formed your particular view of the world? Oh, I, I think we should leave, let this whole thing be carried by Steve, don't you, Tom? I, that was my plan. That was your plan, <laughs> I know. I, I'm not good at, can everybody hear me? I, that's okay. Um, I'm from a small town in Bangor, Maine. I grew up in Bangor, Maine. Um, we had a lot of books in our house, and everybody was very, very funny um, and very witty. My parents were very witty. Um, 
what can I say? We cracked jokes. We didn't have a TV. We didn't have a car. Our house was falling apart, everything. You, you turned a doorknob, and the doorknob came off in your hand. I think part of it probably is my name. Um, my name, I was named for two grandmothers. One is a Mamie, and the other is an Eva. And I think from a very early age, I had to be extremely defensive about my name. So I had to be funny, because it was a real mouthful. Um, but, but I never developed a voice, particularly. It's just the voice that I have. As a writer, you As mean? a writer, no. It's just sort of what came natural. It's just what came natural. And do you think yeah. that you, you looked at the world in a particular way as a kind of defense mechanism, perhaps? I think it's a defense mechanism in a way. Um, I had these very funny parents. My father was very sick, got very sick when I was seven, and spent all of my childhood. He died when I was 18. So things were pretty grim. So I think... Probably that proves your theory, that uh -huh. out of misery comes humor. So we spent a lot of time finding the funny parts of everything. Uh -huh. and, and I feel that when I write, though um, my, my most recent book, The End of an Era, is my very sad and very serious book, and it has a lot of loss in it, and it has death and all kinds of things, that I can't help myself, even in a death scene, this, this grandmother is dying and it's all very sad and I'm just writing this with tears streaming down my face and thinking, oh great, I'm writing tragedy, I'm writing, you know, I'm writing sadness, I'm writing death, this is great, I've gone, you know, up another step in the, the pantheon of seriousness and, um, and then the, the last words of this grandmother turn out to be dying is so boring. I've never been so bored in my life. And, and it sort of, I don't know, levitates the whole scene. And I just couldn't help myself. There it was. <laughs> so that's it. Can't help yourself. Can't that's help myself. Yeah. Tom, do you have a, an answer to that question? Is your New Jersey background responsible for your <laughs> comedic view of the world? Yeah, I, I wonder why people from New Jersey have uh, inferiority complexes. <laughs> because we get needled all the time. I'm from Woburn, Mass, by the way, so <laughs> I can relate. Um, you know, I actually do think um, there's something about where I came from that um, is in my work. There's a certain kind of uh, populism that I think is a kind of trademark voice of New Jersey. When you think of, um, you know, the, the artists that that place has produced, there is a kind, you know, you, you think of, somebody like Sinatra or Bruce Springsteen or, um, you know, Philip Roth. Um, there, there's a sense that this is art that comes from below, not, not from above. It's, it, you know, Princeton is not, doesn't define New Jersey. In fact, it seems like this sort of alien presence there. Um, and, and, so it's an underdog perspective? There, there's a kind of underdog perspective. You know, when I read Hamlet, I don't uh, identify with Hamlet. I identify with the grave diggers. <laughs> The, the ones who are standing on the side saying, you know, let the prince have his tragedy. You know, I'll do my job and, and watch from over here. Um, so, you know, that, that's, that's a question of class. It's a question of uh, geography. But I do feel very, you know, connected to a place and, and a kind of artistic tradition that, that you know, may be maligned in, in one sense, but um, is actually a source of, um, you know, perverse pride for those of us who... Uh, so it is, is it a question of looking at that other world? I mean, perhaps looking across the river to Manhattan or something and, and um, making fun of it to some extent as a way of well, you're, you're, protecting you're, oneself? That's right. Well, there's some element of that. I mean, it's, it's a complex stance. But I think, I think at the heart of it is some decision not to take yourself uh -huh. so seriously. You're, you're, you know right from the time you're, you're aware of things that you're off to the side a little bit. You're not in the center of it. And uh -huh. the only power one has being off to the side is, you know, making smart remarks under your breath. So if you laugh at yourself first, then you're less wounded by... Um, yeah, yeah, and I think it, also then you're a little bit less sort of inward looking and therapeutic, you kind of make fun of yourself and then you move on uh -huh. to, to the rest of the world. So you, you, I think... I never got to the move on stage, <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> right, well, that's, that's, uh, that's my sense of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Mamiv, um, I see your husband 
Howard is here in the audience tonight. So I don't expect you to answer this question honestly, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, your first no novel deals with a writer's intensely passionate love affair with her <laughs> mailman. How'd you come up with that idea? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> my poor, poor husband. Um, well, we, some of my neighbors are here. I, I recognize a few of them, and we all have this wonderful um, mailman, Joe. I won't even know last names. And, um, who's been, I don't know, 20 years or 15 years, hasn't it? Or for quite a long time. And anyway, I've always, I, I wrote, before I wrote my novel, I wrote short stories. And if you write a short story, you put it in a self-addressed manila envelope and you um, send it out and close the self-addressed, um, self-stamped envelope. And anyway, um, one day my mailman rang my doorbell and said, could I ask you a question? I said, what? And he said, why do you keep getting these manila envelopes all addressed to you with the same handwriting? So I explained that they were my stories coming back from the New Yorker in my self-addressed stamped envelopes, that they were all my rejects. And he looked so sad. He looked so sad. And he said, well, maybe one day I can bring you an acceptance. And, and I went inside and I shut my door and I thought, you know, really, in the life of a writer, who is the most important man? And that's her mailman. <laughs> so I, I do think, you know, so I spun it up from there, and I do think it has been slightly embarrassing from him, for him, but maybe not. You know, I think he got a lot of um, guff down at the, the post office. And in fact, every so often, um, I guess you have to change your uniform so you look spiffy every year or something. So he gives me all his old uniforms. So I have, <laughs> wow. I have a bag. I have, I have a it's winter. It's a real fetish. I have a winter coat and a summer coat. I have a hat with ear flaps, huh. all saying U.S. mail. So I, I now collect mail memorabilia. And um, I, I want to ask Howard a question, but. Um, <laughs> Are you ever required to wear these outfits, Howard? <laughs> oh, what a great idea! Isn't I love that. that. Great? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I mean, most people assume, I'm, I'm afraid, that, that uh, ro novelists are always writing their autobiographies and that Absolutely memoirists are... Absolutely not. Absolutely no. not. And memoirists are just making stuff up. Yeah. Um, at least that's what I think. <laughs> but um, <laughs> at your second novel, Host Family, deals with exchange students and head lice. Um, do you have any experiences with either of those that you'd try to share with us? <laughs> I think everybody's going to flee from all my books in this audience. They so, sound so awful. Um, well, head lice, a as a parent... You know, um, I've dealt with it. I'm sure most of you have dealt with it. Um, it goes through the school, schools like just amazing. So I have dealt with lice, and um, I <laughs> not at the moment. Yeah. Um, and and Howard and I have been host families for students who come to Harvard for a million years. And I always wanted to write about that experience. And I sort of had the characters, and I had. Um, you know, this idea I was going to write about them. And one day I was reading in the New York Times and there was an article in the science section about parasites. And so that was it, a little light bulb went off. And I thought, well, there's my metaphor, hosts and symbiotic relationships. Plus I could use my experience with lice. So um, I did. So my second book is about um, a Cambridge couple who hosts um, students at Harvard. Um, unfortunately, I no longer do this because Harvard got very upset about it. Um, I, they, I told them I was writing this book and they said, well, you have to come and talk to us, talk to, the, to our office when the book comes out. And I said, I'd love to. So the book came out and I called up and I left a message and I said, well, I'm available and nobody called me back. Then I called a few times and nobody called me back and I thought, well, maybe there's something wrong here. So anyway, I I called up um, a woman who had been on the staff who had left, and I said, is there a problem with my book? And she said, yes. I said, what? And then I thought they were going to say, oh, dear, you know, people have affairs and all kinds of things are going on. But she said they were very upset because in one of the scenes um, in the novel at a reception for foreign students, jug wine was served. 
And then <laughs> the Harvard Office of Host Family, International Office of Host Families, pride themselves on serving fine vintages, and they would never serve junk wine. <laughs> So, so that was it. Nobody ever answered. We were never given a student. And finally, is that true? This is absolutely <laughs> true. And then finally, I called up and I said, "Well, it couldn't just be the wine. It must be something else." And and somebody said, "Well, you know, uh, we we were afraid that students coming to Harvard might read your book and get the wrong impression." I said, "But Janet." Jane Langdon wrote a book, Murder in Memorial Hall, and, you know, <laughs> do you think people are going to come and be afraid that they're going to be murdered? This is fiction, and you're Harvard, you know. And so anyway, nothing happened until I was talking to Di Diane White of the Globe, and I told her this story, and she said, that would make a great column. And she started calling up the, the office, and they didn't call, return her calls, but she left a message. And the day after she left a message, somebody from that office called me up and said, we have a student for you. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> that's wow. a very long answer. No, it's great. And, and I had my Massimo story. Did, did you want me to? Sure. Put that. Well, the, the other. Well, let me just add. Um, some of you have heard this. I, I apologize. But but one of the things um, every year when we got a student, we always asked for an Italian because Howard was taking t very badly Italian lessons, and we thought and we love Italy. And they said they never had an Italian. And finally, they called us once and they said, in fact, they had an Italian. And we said, great. And. Um, this guy, Massimo, called us up on the phone. Usually they write a letter. He called us up on the phone and said, um, you know, I'm going to get a doctorate in economics, and I'm coming, and I can't wait to meet you. And they didn't live with us. We just had them for meals and stuff. So I said, well, call us the minute you come, and my husband will come and pick you up, and we'll have you come for dinner. So he called me, and he said he was in student housing on Oxford Street, and I said, Howard will come and pick you up. And he said... He won't have any trouble recognizing me. I'll be outside, and I'm seven feet tall. So I said, what? So then I, you know, I asked the obvious and stupid question, which was, do you play basketball? And he said, um, yes, but I don't anymore because I'm blind. Bye. And he hung up the phone. So I turned to Howard, and I said, well, they would have told me at that office that he was blind. He must, it must be the language. He must be blonde. So anyway, sure enough, Howard pulled up, and it was three steps here, four steps there, and into our house walked this amazing seven-foot-tall blind giant, you know. And, and he turned out to be, I, I have a thousand stories to tell about him, but I'm not going to, but he turned out to be the most extraordinary person, just one, for instance. He went to Martha's Vineyard, and he called me up, and he said, oh, I had the most wonderful time. It's so beautiful. And I said, but you're blind, Massimo. How do you know? And he said, I, I know beauty when I see it. Mm. He called me up another time and asked for the number of the Boston Celtics. I said, why? He said, I need clothes. And <laughs> He, he was Italian. He called Ra Robert Parrish, and he got the name of his um, tailor on Charles Street and got this great. But, but when I tried to write about him, this is, when I tried to write about him, I realized I could not write about him because fiction needs a logic that real life never has. So that in, in, in reality, here is this seven-foot-tall amazing giant, but as soon as I put him in the page, he wasn't real, he wasn't believable, and it didn't work. Huh. I like that idea of needing some kind of logic that life doesn't right. often uh, supply. So. Yeah. Um, Tom, have you ever experienced that sort of thing where there's something that you really want to write about s straight out of your life that just doesn't work on the page because it's too illogical or too unbelievable somehow? No. 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 <laughs> <It's good>. no. <laughs> oh, um, no. You know, if, if I... I mean, this may sound, uh, what, uh, you know, it may sound arrogant in some, in some way. I, if I start it, I, it, I kind of know that I can write about it. I, I, you mean think, once you begin writing? Once I begin. If, if an idea sticks in my head long enough that I actually get around to writing it, um, uh, then I know there's, there's something there. I, um, I, I know what you mean about... The, the seven foot yeah. Italian giant. Oh, that happened to you too. Yeah. 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 
<laughs> but, you know, well, I, you know, this actually, now that you mention it, though, I went, to, I went to high school with a kid, actually to, to junior high, with a kid who got very tall very quickly. Um, he was six foot ten in seventh grade, and he played on our, our basketball team, and he was terrible. And it was just the, the curse of, of his life that, that he was almost seven foot tall and, and couldn't play basketball, and everyone kept making these demands on him. And, and actually, in the first novel that I wrote that didn't get published, I had a long section about a kid who was sort of cursed with, with being very tall and couldn't play basketball. And as the novel developed, it, that section went from 75 pages to about two sentences um, in the final draft. So I, I actually so I ran into the exact same problem as you know. I, I take back my categorical <laughs> no. That height thing just doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you're writing your, your new book, um, uh, uh, Little Children, uh, is about uh, husbands and wives and, and living in the suburbs. And um, there's also a rather controversial, potentially, I haven't read it yet, character of a pedophile who moves into the neighborhood and, and so on. Um, and I know the novel is a little bit darker than some of your others, but I'm wondering if that felt like a very risky thing to do to write about uh, that kind of subject matter in a somewhat comedic tone. Um, no, I think, I mean, I, I did, well, I shouldn't, again, I can always say no. I feel <laughs> perverse tonight. Um, you know, from the beginning of my writing, um, Bad Haircut is a, a collection of coming-of-age stories set in working-class New Jersey in the 1970s. Um, and I think the stories have a certain um, quality to them, which is that uh, they start off being quite funny and end up being pretty sad. And, and there's a sense always of, of that the surface of life is funny, you know. And, and that, I think, really does correspond to the world I grew up in. People seem to, to always be competing to be funny, you know. So there's a kind of verbal energy to the world that, that, that was funny, but it didn't, I think, um, at all exclude the possibility that that things could turn bad, that people could hurt one another, that people were stupid, um, whatever you might think. So there's stories about, you know, about racism, about, um, about death. You know, you know just, uh, I didn't think that to take a comic tone at all um, excluded any, um, a any subjects. Um, that said, uh, this, this new book, um, Little Children, um, is, is, is a fairly dark comic novel. On, on the the uh, front of the story is, is a couple that, a disaffected house husband and a disaffected housewife who meet on the playground and, and start this pretty torrid affair that um, is enabled by the fact that they both have three-year-olds who nap at the same time in the afternoon. So they have this nice hour and a half window, basically, um, to kind of not obliterate the yeah. yeah the boredom in uh, uh, you know in their their sort of stay at home lives, um, but in this town where they live, there, a, a pedophile has been released from prison, and um, obviously it's not a, a joking matter. And there's been you know uh, an event right here in the paper in your hometown, um, you know oh, that yes. that r relates to this. Um, and so there's this kind of sense of menace, and the parents at the playground are very worked up about this guy, and and um, you know, eventually the two stories have to come together, and it was a real challenge for me as a, as a comic novelist, because um, in some ways I'm drawing on all the kind of uh, conventions of, of thrillers um, and crime novels, but but I'm writing about, really I think about, um, the, the some something that that John Updike wrote a lot about too. I think at, at a certain point, you know. Um, the tension between the role of the parent and mm -hmm. being a sexual being out in the world, which in some sense being a, a perennial adolescent, you know, and so um, it's about sex and parenthood basically, and, and there's a, and the tension between those two roles um, about you know wanting to fulfill your appetites and needs and and you know needing to rein those in and be responsible for somebody else, and, and um, throughout this world, you know, the people are kind of trying to balance those tensions. And, and what was hard for me as a writer was figuring out how far I could go. Um, Did you pull back at some point? Uh, the, basically, the book was written with agonizing slowness for about half of it, because um, I saw that it was moving into very dark territory. And I was trying to put the brakes on 
in some way. And oddly, right in the middle of that, um, my parents had a terrible car accident, and it was just a, a awful situation for my family. I was taken away from the book for three or four months, um, and somehow in that period, I just felt like I understood that I had to go as far as the book wanted to go, mm -hmm. that I, I stopped sort of fighting with it, and the second half of the book just sort of poured out, um, so because I was no longer, you know, afraid of uh, the idea that that my comic novel had turned into uh -huh. something that wasn't. Well, when you said earlier that your 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 first stories begin in comedy and then often end in some sad or tr tragic way. It almost sounds as if you feel you work through the comedy that's on the surface of things and the defense mechanism until you get to the real heart of the problem or the, the character's real feelings. Is that true, do you think? Yeah, yeah though I think uh, this felt like a, another step down the road because th those stories were coming-of-age stories, and there was some uh -huh. sense in which the narrator was this kind of resilient, figure at the center of it, that he was going to grow beyond this uh -huh. world and he would be all right. It was kind of narrated with a retrospective voice that maybe you think of, uh, it's om almost nostalgic, even though the stories are not things that you'd feel nostalgic about. But there's, I think, some sense permeates it that um, the narrator would be all right. Uh -huh. I think it, in the book I just wrote, there's a much more sort of irrevocable uh -huh. kind of adult missteps, you know, some sense of, of lives really... Uh, you know, about to unravel, in some cases really unraveling. Hmm. Do you think maybe, has, have you ever tried to write about anything that you felt um, uncomfortable writing about in a comedic voice or that seemed somehow inappropriate to deal with uh, um, through comedy? Not really. I, I think no holds barred. I'm, I'm really willing to write about it anything and um, so I always resent that that thing about light l-i-t-e because I feel that we all deal we who write humor deal with all the things that the serious the big guys deal with which is life and loss and death and everything and we just have a sort of skewed way maybe of looking at it mm -hmm. or a sort of comedic way of looking at it I mean some things I don't want I, I don't particularly write about my own children and some of because it would be a betrayal of trust. But other than that, I, I, it, nothing, you know. Mm. And, and I mean, I start out, I'm very serious. I mean to be very serious about everything I write, but some of it just comes out funny. Well, I always felt, you know, I, I write a lot about uh, gay characters, I don't know why, and um, <laughs> had never felt comfortable writing in my particularly ironic voice yeah. about AIDS, for example, simply because, uh, well, there are a lot of reasons, but, you know, it just never seemed appropriate somehow, and I always tried to write it into my novels and felt that it was somehow not funny uh, that there was something taboo about it, that perhaps I didn't, wouldn't have a, owned that subject quite enough. There, there are some things that just can't be written about in any kind of comic well, way. No, I think you're not willing people to. do. Yeah, people not do, not but not to. for you. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I wanted to ask you about uh, some of your main characters um, who are very insecure and unsure of themselves. And uh, they criticize everything about themselves, yeah. you know, from their feet to their, um, you know, er everything. And uh, it's very amusing and charming in the books. But um, a lot of comedy has at its heart a certain amount of criticism of human behavior and human foibles. And I'm wondering if um, in any way, having a character who is very uh, self-effacing or self-denigrating uh, frees you in some way to look at other people a little more harshly, perhaps. Um, I, I think if I write in the first person, or if it's the I, for instance, in male, the character is the first person, then I can just do whatever I want, or mm -hmm. she can do whatever she wants. That's character because it's all in her head and there's no polit political correctness or there, there are no um, stops on being mean or being nasty or being unlovable or anything. But, but um, I, I like my characters. I, I don't like to write about 
you know, we, we play God in our own world. We're gods in these worlds, and we can create anybody we want. So I have very flawed characters, but there's not one that I'm not terribly fond of. So um, it's really up to the reader. You know, readers have told me, particularly about my last book, oh, well, I can't stand that husband. And other readers have said, well, I just love that husband. Or somebody else has said, well, why did she go with this guy? He's so creepy. And somebody else say, would say, I absolutely understand. You know, so it's up to the reader. I mean, there is a certain amount of, you do have the power to get back. For instance, you can always call a minor character the name of somebody you didn't like in junior high school. You know, that's really fun. And you can always do a kind of set piece. I have in one of my books uh, uh, just a terrible reading. You know, this character goes to a reading and she has to share um, the platform with somebody else who's a, a dog trainer and just, you know, all of that person's books are there and none of hers and there's a line out the door with, for the other person's books and nobody buys her books. That kind of thing, that's so lovely that I have the power to write about that, that kind of thing. But there are always little set pieces and they're less mean than just sort of therapy, I think. So you don't think that... Uh well, how do you make a distinction between laughing at a character? Or how do you know when you're laughing with a character or you're, you're inviting the reader to laugh with the character rather than to laugh at them? Or oh, I don't think I have that control. Yeah. You know, it's really up to the reader. Uh, I try, you know. Hmm. But do you ever, do, what do you think, Tom? Do you ever, are ever aware of that? I mean, the, in, in election, for example, um, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of, misbehavior by characters and in some ways um, they do a lot of inadmirable things and, and, and some of the characters are quite reprehensible. Um, but do you have a sense of... Yeah, well, I think... I, I was going to talk about the wishbones, which... which okay. um, and I'll get back to that. But, but in election, um, I, I, I think what, what my method there was to do was, again, to get that out of the way early, uh -huh. basically to evoke each of the characters as a kind of um, comic high school stereotype and then allow them to do something at some point that made you realize that they were bigger than that. Mm -hmm. um, in, in Tracy's case, to let you see into her home life and, and then in, into her, her kind of existential loneliness, you mm -hmm. know. Um, and, you know, Mr. M, to see him basically as, as somebody thinking that he's protecting the, the weak from the strong. I mean, basically just giving everybody their reasons and, and you know, allowing them both their folly and, and their kind of, um, their dignity of, of actually being motivated by uh, reasons that they can actually explain to themselves. Uh -huh. um, so that, that they, they get to be laughed at as types and then become complex characters. I think it'd be bad to do it the other way. Yeah. Right, um, right. Yeah. Um, if not impossible. If not, yeah. um, my book, The Wishbones, is about a bunch of uh, serious rock musicians who didn't make it in, in that world and became a wedding band. Um, and they, they were based really on, on people I grew up with who I really admired. You know, uh, I went away to college thinking, oh, these guys are going to be stars. And I came home to see them in tuxedos, you know, <laughs> playing feelings. Um, and uh, I think I wrote the book, I thought as a kind of, tribute to them and a, and a real sense of like, what do you do when, you know, your dream kind of runs out of gas? Um, and some of them say, the hell with the dream, I'm going to become a, you know, a regular person. And some of them keep going, and, and this was the way some of them did. And I thought, in a way that, that I, I treated them fairly, that the Times review, uh, which is a very good review, but, but, but started out by saying, you know, these guys should seem like a bunch of losers but they don't. And, and I thought, okay, that, that's good. They understood the book. But the guys that I was writing about were really hurt by that, that the bare facts of their life would suggest yeah. that they were a bunch of losers. Um, but, but just for instance, in that, in that book, one of the characters um, is writing a, a musical about the Kennedy assassination. Um, and at a crucial moment in the process of seducing this woman, he unveils his, um, his demo tape of the Kennedy assassination <laughs> musical. And for a lot of the, the writing of the book, I knew that I was moving toward a description of what this musical was. Um, 
Springtime for Lee Harvey yeah, Oswald. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> what was essential for me as a writer, and, and not to get into this laughing thing, you, basically the idea is funny enough. Mm -hmm. And what happens in the execution, of course, is that um, it's actually surprisingly good. And the woman is very moved by what she hears and, and sort of falls in love with him um, at that moment. And, and uh, I actually, whenever I read it, I get sort of choked up. It seems like a very... Um, <laughs> so it's not meant serious. to be... It's not, it's not meant to point her out as ridiculous. You really... No, no. I, I mean, I... I and, but, it, but it wasn't like... I started out... I started out thinking this will be a great comic opportunity for me to write a hilariously bad, you know, producer right. style, um, you know, set piece. And then as I approached, realized that, you know, I respected the character too much. Uh -huh. um, there's something wrong, about, fundamentally wrong about the project, but he does it about as well as you possibly can, <laughs> given the fundamental wrongness. Um, do you think, I mean, uh, my opening comments about, you know, uh, the American uh, literary canon and so on, I mean, they're a little bit exaggerated, to put it mildly. Um, and certainly there are a lot of writers... Uh, I mean, Edith Wharton, for example, despite Ethan Frome, did write a lot of uh, very funny books and stories and so on. And Mark Twain is perhaps the great American writer. I mean, who knows? But um, And certainly there are a lot of great writers who are uh, comedic in, in certain moments. But I'm wondering if you think there's something in the American spirit or American history perhaps that accounts for a more somber tone uh, in our literature. I mean, because it is true, I think, that you can point to many more examples of um, revered comedic fiction in British literature than in American. Um, well, compared to the Germans, we're pretty funny. Yeah, well. <laughs> Do you think it's the, pure, the Puritan <laughs> ethic or, or, or Americans' desire for improvability, you know? Or mm. I was just talking to my editor de today, and I said, well, we're, we're doing this comment <clears throat> panel on comedy, and he said he was reading something in some magazine about the Oscars, and it said that, you know, comedians never win the Oscar. It's only tragic actors who win the Oscar, and I think probably, hmm. probably in Britain... You know, Hugh Grant wins every Oscar. Yeah, I think so. But doesn't he win uh, for the serious roles usually? Yeah, but he wins for, you know, the heavy-duty psychiatrist, don't you think? Who's bringing people out of a coma after 20 years. Yeah, that sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. Robin Williams. So. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I was wondering if, I mean, I have this theory, frankly, um, based on nothing, that... Um, uh, no, but I, I was recently spent some time in Canada and, and noticed that when you watch Canadian TV and you watch late night talk shows, there are lots of people um, making fun of themselves as Canadians. And you can say, well, they've got good reason to be. But, um, but there really is a, a sense of, um, a sense of humor about themselves and their nationality and so on that, that's quite striking. Um, and it's very rare that you, that Americans have that perspective on ourselves. I mean, I think we take ourselves rather seriously, our place in the world as the, you know, the only superpower on the planet and so on. And I don't know if there's something uh, in that or not. I mean, do you have any, do you buy that? Um, well, we haven't been the only superpower. You forever. Know, f forever. Yeah. Um, it may have been that, that, you know, as a relatively new country, you know, you, you, some of the writers you've mentioned, like like Cather and Twain, right. you know, these are people who are, you know, documenting a kind of struggle right. of, of, of a nation to create itself. So um, maybe they didn't find that that struggle that funny, but it is odd. Yeah. Um, or that there was a feeling somehow that it had that they were creating something. You know, this uh, frontier nation that they were, you know, creating something serious and uh, rich. Mm -hmm. And that it couldn't be, therefore, comedic. I don't know. The little engine that could. Maybe. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. just that's just a, a theory, you know. I don't know. Um, uh, maybe you've, you've taught writing uh, quite a bit. Um, I know, and you've written about writing teachers. I'm wondering if uh, I found I've also taught writing a lot. And I found that most of the humor in student stories was of the unintentional variety. <laughs> um, and um, I'm wondering, do you ever? find that students who want to think of themselves as serious writers feel that they somehow need to have 
need to be given permission to write in a, a lighter tone? Or? I think so. I think so. I think, you know, it's really interesting. I, I know you probably, both of you, I, I was judging some, was it the Winship or the one of those contests at the Hemingway Center. I'm sure both of you have done that. And they send you, it's all the novels of New England, I guess, that have either New England authors or New England in the title, in the in the text. Um, and there were just tons and tons of books, and I started reading them. And they were no funny novels, just one after the other after the other with not a shred of humor. So I think... Maybe it's New England. Maybe it's New, yeah, maybe it's New England. Yeah, it could very well be. But, you know, what's wrong with a little entertainment? You know, do you think it's New England? You do? It's the weather. It's the weather. weather. It's the Puritan tradition. It's, somebody once said to me, well, when are you going to write a serious novel? And I, I feel that I'm writing a serious novel. You know, I mean, what's wrong with, you know, a laugh every so often? Nothing. 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 So, um, um, I wanted to talk just a little bit about your relationship with readers, um, because it seems to me that there is something uh, particularly intimate about trying to elicit laughter from from a from a reader. And um, first of all, I was wondering if uh, Tom, if you ever communicate with your your readers, and if you have a particular reader in mind when you're writing? Well, I often have my mother in mind, and I think how upset she's going to be <laughs> when, uh, she reads it. <laughs> when she reads it. Um, and you write to that. <laughs> yes, I, I try to make her as upset as I possibly can. Um, it's good to have a goal. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I think, like a lot of writers, I, I hear occasionally, you, basically you hear from people who are really very happy with what you've done or very unhappy with what you've done. And, and often you, you can't know what's going to make people unhappy. Um, in, in a story called Race Ride in, in Bad Haircut, um, basically all the um, sort of violent weirdos of the town kind of come together for because they think there's going to be a, a race riot. Um, and there's a, just a kind of a almost Homeric listing of, of their <laughs> depredations. And, and it just mentioned that there's a certain guy who is rumored to have... Um, buried a cat up to its neck and run its head over with a lawnmower, which is a, a, a sort of famous urban legend. You'll hear this uh, in every town where there are kids who are proud I hear to, it be, daily. to yeah. be to be psychos. Um, it was certainly a story I heard about. <laughs> I just grew up in a different town. From you. <laughs> it's the same town. <laughs> um, and, and, of course, I got um, a, a very, um, really just outraged letter from um, someone in um, people for the ethical treatment of animals, saying, you know, why, why would you? I, I was enjoying your book. I was enjoying the story, and that one sentence just just ruined it for me. Um, and and she really wanted to know, you know, why would you kind of poison the world with 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 something like this? And I and my first thought was, oh, I got I got a nut, and I'll just throw this out. But then I thought, no, you know, somebody took the trouble to write to me. I should write back. And I tried to explain. Um, that the story was about racial violence. It was about, um, you know, making something the other so that you could then, um, you know, treat it without without respect and treat it violently. And, and I tried to, you know, talk about the the way in which something that seemed arbitrary or, or done for no reason at all actually belonged to the, the universe of the story in a way that made sense to me. And, you know, and I actually got a thoughtful letter back, you know, from this person saying, oh, I, I'm very reassured um, to know that you had a, a reason, and I almost can see your reason, though. The very thought of what you wrote, you know, makes me ill. Um, <laughs> which, you know, it should, but I, I was sort of arguing that, that there are times when it's the writer's job to make you a little bit ill, and that I wasn't doing it, um, mm -hmm. you know, in the story about the prom, for example. It, it was in a particular story for a particular reason. Um, I actually had one um, correspondence with, with a reader that turned out to basically save a book for me. Um, when I wrote The Wishbones, I got a letter from a guy who'd grow, uh, grown up near where I did who told me that you know, he really loved the book. He, I was writing you know, this world that he'd never seen uh, before. It was his world. Um, but I had made six errors, six factual errors, um, often about 
geographical or song titles, whatever, and he, he wrote them up as a list. You know, he says, here, here are your six errors. Um, and he finished by saying, so to spare yourself this sort of embarrassment in the future, why don't you send me your books um, <laughs> b- before, they're, before they're published? And I can check them, and y- you, won't, you won't look foolish again like you do now. Um, and again, I was about to throw, throw it away, thinking, you know, with fans like these, I you know, don't really need critics. Um, but then I, or fact-checking, yeah, copy yeah, editors. Or yeah. But again, you know, I, I, I thought, I, I read it again, and, and it really was couched in all this sort of praise and some, almost some sense that, you know, we were in this together. You know, and that he wanted us to, to be as good as we possibly could be. <laughs> and, How does he feel about your mother? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and so I wrote back, and I said, well, thanks. You know, um, I took issue with a couple of his uh, corrections. And, and, but I said, you know, I don't need a fact checker. What I really need is, is a lunch truck driver. Because I was writing a book called Joe College, which is about a, a Yale student whose father has a lunch truck, and he goes home for spring break, and he drives it, and lots of crazy things happen. And I, I tried around here to find a lunch truck driver. And it's a very insular world, you know, and, and I'm not from it. And I'd go up to these guys, and I'd say, look, I'll, I'll pay you, you know, if you let me just sit in your truck and drive around with you and find out how your business works. And I, I couldn't even get, like, like, no. I'd just be like, you know, get the fuck away from me, <laughs> you know. I, I just couldn't get near these guys. And, and I wrote to my, the, my critic, and he wrote back and said, you know what, my best friend drives a lunch truck. <laughs> And he'll be happy to, to take you around. And he did, and, and it saved the book. <laughs> right back to those right pranks. Back, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Mamie, what about you? Do you have well, a... Uh... I do, and I brought a letter that I'm going to read okay. uh, from one of my readers. It says, Dear Miss Medwed, I am a dental hygienist who writes what I call a fun column gratis for the Los Angeles Dental Hygienist Society newsletter. <laughs> the state one and other journals called Hygienists in Print, Fiction and Nonfiction. It includes anything to do with dentists, hygienists, and dentistry. What I try to do is give an insight as to why the dental aspect was included, but I don't critique the work. <laughs> Included in the column are what I call dental tidbits to nibble on. (laughs) I am always happy when someone mentions a dentist or hygienist or teeth because I always hope it it will inspire someone to call their dental office to set up an appointment. (laughs) I promise you. It may seem insignificant to you, the dental hygienist mention, but I consider any time a hygienist is included a fantastic moment. This is probably because it is rare to see hygienists in print or any other media. I must say, we are on the rise. I thoroughly enjoyed reading mail, read it in one sitting, and I look forward to your next book. I liked cover and chapter pages. Of course, the dental hygienist mention made it a little extra special for me. (laughs) Uh, Now she said, uh, then she said, I would like to include mail in my cameo appearances of hygienist column that I am writing. Is it possible to answer a few questions? Here are the questions. One, on page 11 you write, I should move back to Old Town and become something more suitable to my abilities, a dental hygienist or a grammar school crossing guard. Question, is there any special reason that you included a dental hygienist? (laughs) Two, on page 37, your description of Katinka includes, thanks to braces, a discernible overbite. Any reason for this? Three, page 193, Katinka and her mom are talking, and Katinka mentions that she's read somewhere that widows aren't supposed to make sudden decisions. One place you include where she had read that is a dentist's waiting room. (laughs) Any reason for that location? (laughs) I have a question about a word on page 277. You write, I read everything, as you should recall. I was in the bathroom. I finished with the news articles. I went to the toothpaste bottle, and the box of soap comes in. Did you mean toothpaste bottle or box or tube? That was a mistake if I'd only gotten this on my galley. B, your dental tidbits are on page 331, toothpaste, 45, chiclet teeth, 
64, 65 silver filling glints, 82, 97, two front teeth of an eager beaver, 115, 135, 164, rickrack teeth, 198, 204, pages heading, including dental hygiene. Glad you to see you included that. 244, 247, 265. Have you written anything else with dental goodies in it? <laughs> Any input would be greatly appreciated. Her email is loissmile at aol.com. <laughs> So, I mean, I can't say anything. I can't add anything. Some people really do have too much free time. I know. <laughs> well, I have a lot of other questions, but I just can't imagine topping that. So um, I think maybe we should end there. I, um, I brought one thing. Can I read? Could you bear? I brought one other thing that I wanted to read. Yes, I briefly. Love to hear it. This is, by, is it about this, teeth? No. This no. is by a very famous writer in my neighborhood named Stephen McCauley. This is an email you sent me. Steve and I sent emails back and forth sometimes. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> no. <laughs> we whine and complain. But this is about, this is, I found this, and it's about um, comic fiction, and you wrote it, and I think it's brilliant. He talks about, um, I feel such kinship with that horrible feeling that, after all, we're just writing these pointless domestic comedies and really should be lined up and shot for unleashing them into the world. But how can I feel that way when the books I most like to read and in some ways respect the most are the small domestic comedies, the Barbara Pins and the Ann Tylers and Muriel Sparks? There's a lot of other stuff I adore, but even rereading Anna Kay recently, it was the smallness and intimacy of so much of it that struck me as brilliant, not the vast scope. The pleasure for me is in the selection of tiny moments. And when I think about all this in terms of other writers, I think that writing this kind of smart, funny, and uh-oh, entertaining fiction really is the highest calling in some peculiar way. It's what I most enjoy reading and what seems to be the most underappreciated in the big world of critics. And it is hard work to do it well and make it funny and make it true, and that's what's so often overlooked. And you so often make it those very things. I mean, poo on all those serious novels about someone drowning in the pool and getting raped by daddy. I'm sick of them. Throw in a, <laughs> that's you. Throw in a little incest and what? It's suddenly literature? So if you and I were writing fat, heavily researched books, we'd hate them too and think they were, were without real value. I guess it's important to keep that in mind. I think we just have to do what we do and what we really deep down inside, don't you think, want to do. So we just have to keep in mind the people who really do like the books, even if drooling. And remember what a wonderful privilege it is to make someone, some stranger, a wee bit happy for a few hours. What a nice thing to be able to do. We have to make sure that breathing our last breath, we hear the drooling fan who has no ax to grind, no resentments or hidden agendas, after all, saying our books help them through a rough day or bad week or difficult breakup. That's what matters. That's from you. Wow. I've got too much time in my hands, too. I know. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions they would like to ask? Did you think up your questions? <laughs> yes. Has the comic novel has the form changed of the comic novel over the years? There's more sex. Mm -hmm. Yeah, language. I wanted to ask about sex, but yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I think we're freer to write anything. I think I think there's more uh, sort of hybrid novels where you know comedy some aspect um, rather than like the the pure comic writers, the Woodhouses, and, um, you know, the, those New Yorker writers who were doing, you know, humor, say. Mm -hmm. I mean, humor, I guess there's still humor as a genre, but it's not yeah. really a literary genre quite so much. Well, you got David Sedaris, maybe, yeah. um, and, and some other people. Um, I don't know, there's probably less sort of purely verbal humor. Uh, you know, I, I, I love the writer Thomas Berger, 
who is sort of uh, a, a little bit forgotten these days, but but was I mean just just his sentences they're just little adventures you know the, the, and often there's some very funny gap between the inflated rhetoric and and what's being described. Um, it's a very old form of of humor um, that he mm. was probably the last uh, r- real master of. But that that's a specific case. I'm not sure I know. Um, if I could speak to really broad trends in terms of, of humor, writing, comic writing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm sure. It's we an interesting a, question. Though. We need a scholar on the panel. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> What's it like keeping funny the editing and hand to What's it like uh, trying to keep your work funny going through an editing process? Well, I mean, one difficult thing is is that no two people find the same thing funny, funny. or amusing or anything else. And, and I think a lot of it, uh, you just have to go with your gut instinct. Um, although I must say that usually when I'm writing the thing that I find absolutely the most hilarious, you know, that just, you know, um, is inevitably the thing that gets cut out as, you know, <laughs> no one thinks it's the least bit funny. Um, I think it helps to stay, um, for me, it, I, I'm, I'm very, um, you know, depressed, um, just generally unhappy person. And, it, <laughs> and there's something about maintaining that level of, you know, misery that generally, and when, when you're editing a book, it, you know, that's kind of increases. So. And, and sometimes it's just a matter of pulling back. If you've got three jokes, you know, you get rid of two and you keep the one good one. Or in the editing process, it, it just goes, you know, sometimes too too far over the top. So it's just pulling back and pulling back and making whatever is there pure and, and zingy um, and undiluted by anything any other stuff around it. Well, and I think the question actually goes to any effect in your writing. It's sort of like you may think you've written a good sad scene, you may think you've written a good description, but you read it 10, 12, 15 times, and suddenly you, you just can't tell. There's a moment yeah. when it seems completely boring. And, and that's, I guess, when you need um, s- some fresh opinion. You know, it really helps to hand it to somebody and, and hear them, you know, if not crack up, at least give a little chuckle there. Because um, I, think, I think there is just, you know, you swing as a writer between thinking you just wrote the greatest thing ever to thinking, you know, it, it's... I, I, I had a dream right before I went to um, graduate school for creative writing. Um, and it was basically the first workshop, and the teacher wheeled my work out um, on, on a blackboard. And he brought his face right up to mine and cackled in this horror movie way, and he said, it's not even words. <laughs> 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 and it, I think, you know, in the process of writing a book, you know, it just at times it's not even words. That's how you miss the typos a hundred times, and you're just yeah. not seeing it anymore. Mm-hmm. And I, who knows what you're even reading at that point. Mm-hmm. In back, one more question. The difference between high and low modes of humor. Um, well, I know where I come down in that <laughs> spectrum. Um, I, you know, I don't. I, certainly, that's nothing that I would ever think about in any conscious sort of way. I mean, f- for me. Um, Comedy is always a tool to get to look a little bit more closely at characters and at some kind of something that I consider a truth about human behavior. And um, I, I, my own, my hope is that if that if one keeps it truthful, um, that no matter how exaggerated it is around the edges, that um, it gets at something that has some kind of significance, perhaps for the reader or perhaps just for me, but um, and then that high or low comedy doesn't matter quite so much, um, in my mind, anyway. You don't want cheap jokes at the expense of the well, story. I don't know. No? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. No, I'm well, uh, see, I, I grew up in a very um, repressive Catholic family, and I wasn't allowed to use bad language, and really, really took that to heart till about age 13, when I kind of broke through that wall. Um, and, and periodically in my work, they're just these sort of um, profane soliloquies. Um, in, in Bad Haircut, uh, a drunken teenager goes off on um, 
uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. There's a long kind of um, really r brutally profane um, discussion of, of that story and, and what's wrong with it. Um, in the wishbones, these two guys have a kind of a profanity contest. I, I still find it very cathartic. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, I think low humor. Uh, I mean, read Don Quixote. Read the first few yeah. chapters of that. It makes uh, Eddie Murphy look tame. <laughs> Well, um, we were told to. Oh, one more question. Okay. Uh, the question is about regionalism in American humor. Um, anyone want to oh, take that yours. question? <laughs> you can have that oh, one. I have well, I, th I think like most regionalisms in American culture, it's sort of fast disappearing. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, you think of somebody like David Sedaris, and you, I mean, he's, uh, I guess, technically a southerner. He's from, mm -hmm. what, Maryland or... Virginia, uh, North Carolina, North Carolina. Uh, there you go. Uh, um, who knows? But you, you know, it, it, it's hard to connect him with a Southern tradition. Say he seems. Um, and Woody Allen is strictly New York, don't you think? There's definitely there, New York yeah. Jewish humor. Yeah. 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 So, but but you think it's kind of the lines are blurring, which is probably I do. Probably I, I think there's a kind of sitcom, yeah. but um bum. Uh, humor that has become workplace humor, you know, which has to do with these taglines and these tones of voice that are kind of universal. You know, if you walked into uh, an office in Kansas or uh, an office in Vermont, people would be be doing the same banter and the same mm -hmm. tones that they've learned from from television. Um, I mean, you think of of really unique regional humorists. You think of somebody like like Flannery O'Connor, who I guess you mm -hmm. know was writing you know what she thought was life and death stuff, but mm -hmm. in a kind of you know slapstick. <laughs> vain and, you know, clearly the deep religious feeling of where she came from kind of uh, place, pl places really interesting pressure on the work and on, on what she did. Um, I think there's a specific humor that comes out of black culture, regardless of, of whether it's uh, urban or, or, or rural. Um, yeah. So there definitely, you know, are American schools of humor, but I, I suspect that, that fewer and fewer well, there, uh, or maybe it's maybe it's more a question of uh, some kind of identity that the writer has, whether it's you know racial or ethnic or uh, sexual preference. Right. Or, Good. You, you, know, might, you might consider Sedaris as a gay writer before he's a right. North Carolina writer. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you all very much for listening and having a good time.